Welcome to another episode of Season 3 of the Panjue Podcast. As usual, you can find our episodes on YouTube, Facebook, and your favorite podcast platform, whether that's Spotify or Apple iTunes, iHeartRadio, you pick it, we're there. If you want to support the podcast financially, we've set up a few ways for you to do so this season. You can become a patron by hopping over to patreon.com slash the Panjway podcast and sign up for a small monthly donation. If you want to make a one-time donation, you can find us on Venmo at the Panjway podcast. And last but not least, we've got a small selection of merchandise in our store. So if you head over to the Panjoypodcast.com and click on the store tab, you'll see stickers and other merchandise and who knows what might come down the pipeline. All that I can hope is you take me with you when you go. I guess I should have known I can't leave with you when you go. Now Cow Island is awfully quiet with your screen door stay. You're a uh, staff sergeant now, right? Yes, that's correct. Cool, cool, cool. You think you'll stay in the military? You think you'll leave at some point? Yeah. Uh, you... So my plan is to stay in for 20 years. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I'm at the halfway mark. There is, there's no sense in getting out. You know, if if I can stay in the army till 20 years, I'm all for it. I mean, especially where I'm at, it's the easiest job in the world. I mean, granted, there's a lot of hard work that goes into it, but I enjoy the work. And honestly, the army's not that hard to to stay in that long and it, and to be successful. Yeah, yeah, the army's definitely a what you make of it kind of thing. Yeah, um, exactly. And honestly, I've been fortunate enough to have you know good leadership and be in organizations that are that are awesome to be in. So you obviously never served time in third ID. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it served time in uh, second ID. I mean, I've I've got a little bit of experience under my belt uh, in the big army, and um, just you know, being in the army for a year and then coming to this unit and seeing how different it is on the other side of the coin. You know, um, being here, you know, I appreciate every bit of it i mean i remember long hours i mean i remember you know at four nine we would have to be at the company area by five thirty because you know you know formations at six thirty every day right but because our company were so bad at guys showing up on time they backed it up to five thirty, and even even then guys are still showing up late well, you gotta have, you, gotta have the, you gotta have the team formation at five thirty, so you can have the squad yep. formation at five forty-five, so you yep. can have the platoon formation at six o'clock, so you can have yep. the company formation at six fifteen. Exactly. Because then you can so you can start PT at six thirty. Yes, exactly. That's exactly. Fuck, that's right. why I fucking hate the army. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, so being at the army marksmanship unit, right? Seven thirty, dude. Everyone is there, like between like seven and seven fifteen. Like, I would say 99% of the time, unless they've got appointments or something like that, or like the front gate is extremely backed up, that's the only time they're late. But, you know, 99% of the time, everyone is on time. Most guys are showing up like 30 minutes early. Because you're in a unit that a lot of people are very lucky to get into, you know? Right. That's a, but, that's, I mean, they, and they, they take it very seriously. It's kind of like being in soft. You know, yeah, like you worked very hard to get there. And no one wants to blow it just for doing no. something stupid like being late. No, and the other thing too is like everybody wants to be there. They know that if the later they get in, they're losing um, minutes and hours on training. So, you know, everyone who shows up for work every day, they are there. They are ready to go. Like they get in the office. They, you know, we have uh, a team chief and assistant team chief and squad leaders. As long, you know, for me, for my guys, I tell them like, hey. You know, as long as you come through the office and I at least see you at a bare minimum, I'm good. You can just 
walk right in front of my desk out the back door and then you can start training, you know, and that's okay. As long as I know that you're here and I see you for accountability, I'm good. You know, we don't have formations. We just show up to the office and the guys are just show up and they'll hit the range. They'll get their gear on. They'll start, you know, slinging lead down range. What, uh, where does your lower enlisted guys come from? And do they go into the military joining? So a lot of our thing? lower enlisted guys, um, 95% of them come from the NCAA. Uh, so the reason why uh, we select the guys out of NCAA is number one, it gets their college out of the way. Um, it gets all their partying and immaturity out of the way. So a lot of guys that come in, you know, you kind of want them to be a little bit more mature. And the great thing about NCAA is that um, they learn to uh, train as teammates with other people. They learn training schedules, they learn fitness, they learn nutrition, and they learn how to travel and work with um, other teammates because it's huge, you know, um, because our teams are so small, you know, being able to train and travel with these guys and gals day in and day out, it's a lot, you know, we're asking a lot of them. And especially if they're gonna spend their entire career here, you know, just imagine, you know, trying to train with someone and be next to someone Excuse me. and then go through the frustrations with them for, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 years, it's, it's a lot. So, you know, being able to be a team player, a good teammate, that that's a very big deal for us, you know, because you, you don't want guys butting heads in you know, with each other. I mean, cause yeah, we're all trying to make the team, but at the same time, we are all one team. We all have the same goal. Nice. Well, we're definitely going to talk more about the market the unit, unit that you're in. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, later in the episode, <laughs> a little bit later on, yeah. <laughs> which we, tr- we try to be somewhat chronological, because um, I'm I got I got a lot of more questions about it. But I know if I start asking them, we're going to go down a rabbit hole. People are going to be confused as shit when they. I've listen got some to the cliff notes the for episode. Good. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Uh, but God, Kevin, I'm going to be an asshole right now. I'm going to make sure that I know how to pronounce your last name right. <laughs> I'm going to take a stab at it. Can I? Sure, go for it. You in? Perfect. Oh, ah. my gosh. All right, then, <laughs> Luke, you get to introduce our guest. <laughs> so our guest today is is uh, Staff Sergeant Kevin Nguyen, who uh, was in the unit that replaced us in Panjway. And uh, so what was it, 1-5? No. Uh, we were 4-9. Four 4-9 nine. Four four nine nine infantry. 4-9 So they were actually, it, it was kind of weird when we got replaced, because we got replaced by one three eight. Yes. Um, which was kind of a similar scenario, I think, where... You know, I think like the the battle spaces got changed over um, because one two three used to own Zangabad, but they also own Zangabad, Spare One Gar, Kenjakak, Mushan Lion. But then when four nine came in, they did not get Spare One Gar and they did not get Kenjakak. So I don't know. I think they just changed the way they divided them up when they did that, mm-hmm. that changeover. So I remember the way that I remember it was. It actually went in order. So if you start from the north of the horn and go down, it was A Co and then B Co and then C Co at the very bottom, along with HHC at Zangabad. And that's how it okay. went. A B C from from north to south. And I bet the reason for that is you guys didn't have attachments. So one, two, three had two attached companies. They had us with one six four who were attached to them and also our Charlie company was attached to them. So they actually had five line companies instead of three. Okay, so they had no um, reach. I remember we we had the engineers on our fob, and we had EOD, and then we had um, uh, AWG on our compound as well. And then our FET teams, uh, I don't quite remember where they went because we had FET teams um, prior to deployment. Because I remember seeing them in formations, and they went to uh, NTC with us. But I don't quite remember where they went after that because I remember we spent um, we sent off one of our uh, squads to work with the FET teams and they were off somewhere else in Afghanistan and I don't remember where they went. They didn't join us until I think after I left. Actually, no. So they actually joined us, but they weren't actually part of our platoon patrols until way later. Um, I think they were there for like a week or two, uh, and then I got hurt. And then they finally joined the platoon afterwards. Because I remember that they were in uh, a different tent on the other side of where we were staying. But you, but you guys didn't have any like entire infantry companies attached to you. No, you we just did had not. your normal. Yeah, that, I, I bet you that's why it got split up then. Because uh, I, I know we had we had the FET teams and we had you know, mm-hmm. obviously the EOD and um, the signals guys and 
the dog handlers and all that kind of stuff. I think it's pretty. Yep. Well, actually, but you guys had the the new dog handler thing. What did they call them? The um, Oh gosh! Like the where they gave like a dog to like an infantry private. I can't remember what the name of the program was called. It was a terrible, horrible idea. Was it really? Because oh, I, yeah. I remember our dog handler. Um, his name was um, uh, Private Senna. We sent him off, and I think he had a German Shepherd. Yeah. So the reason I think it's a terrible idea uh, is because. When you when you run the military working dog teams, the, mm-hmm. those guys before the way we did it, we had Navy Air Force handlers. Their responsibility was the dog. They didn't answer the company commander. So like if the company commander said, "Hey, you need to go do this with your dog," they could tell the company commander to fuck off because <laughs> their dog is done. They can't risk the dog. They, their number one responsibility is the dog. Right. But if you have like an infantry private who answers to that company commander, he's gonna do whatever that company commander says, and it's gonna mm-hmm. be at the expense of the dog and the mission. So that's why I don't, I can't remember what the name of the teams were. There was a special <laughs> name for like the, the training. Yeah. Um, Somebody patted the OER on that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, I, obviously I would have loved to have been a private in Afghanistan and had my own dog, but I think in the yeah. grand scheme of things, it's better to have. Yeah. Dude, like, you get your own room and everything with AC yeah. and here, like <laughs> yeah. no one bothers you because it's just you and the dog. Like right. uh, how better way to enjoy your plan and have your own room instead of like being in the tent with like 10 other dudes. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> so I would have totally I mean, been on bad. board with it, but uh, <laughs> I think as far as uh, mission capability, I think it was a bad idea because sometimes, sometimes it's good to be able to tell somebody to fuck off, yeah, and without without consequence or with relatively without consequence. But anyway, that's a anyways. Long, before we get into the nuances tangent. of, of <laughs> uh, organizational structures and your unit in Afghanistan, Kevin, uh, typically how we kick these things off is we let mm-hmm. folks. You know what? What's what's the quick and dirty version of like why you joined the army and why you chose the infantry? You know, give us the the three minutes spiel on, and then so how you I ended joined, up in Banjway. Um, in two thousand and eleven, I believe it's about a year. So I joined a year after a year and a half after college. I realized that college wasn't for me. Um, my biggest Common reason theme. was, yep. Uh, so I was actually writing this and um, just reading it, and I was like, oh man, I'm so dumb. So, you know, we all get tired of living under our parents' rules and being told what to do. And what do we do? We join an organization. Then you go right back to what you said you didn't want to do, being told what to do. When you do, you're a private and you get told exactly what to do. And that's that's why I joined. I, I believe Luke had a similar realization on yeah. the, uh, the episode we just recorded with the Boardwalk Bot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I said mine wasn't my parents. My parents basically let me do what I wanted, but uh, it was a school that I went to. It was very regimented. And so I was like, fuck yeah. these people, I'm out. I'm not going to do what they tell me to do. <laughs> Midnight curfew? Yeah, right. And uh, yeah, yeah exactly. joke's on me. Nine months later, I was in the Army. But same thing, you yeah, know, college. To do. Tried, yeah. to, tried to do the college thing. It did not pan out. Were you? Did you make it through college before you enlisted? Uh, so I did a year and a half of college. I didn't. I didn't graduate. It's. I just oh, got okay. Bored, I thought you said honestly. you did a year. I thought you and said then you did so a year the other thing too is after. like, um, kind of looking back at it, uh, I learned better by doing. And like sitting in a classroom bores me to death. I mean, so like if you stick me in a right. class with True. powerpoints, like especially those army classes, dude, I will fall asleep guaranteed. That's my powerpoint. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's yeah. just like anyone else in the what, army. What made you land on the? What made you land on the infantry? Why'd you do the, the infantry? Man, man, if, yeah, you know, you know how you have that meme where it says, you know, you played too much Call of Duty? Yeah, I'm probably contributed to that <laughs> meme. Join the army because I played way too much Call of Duty. Um, so originally when I joined, uh, um, I wanted to see some action, you know, just like any young guy coming out of, the, uh, coming out of yeah. high school, you know? Um, but I, when I originally signed up, uh, the only MOS that was available was a 19 Delta. I was like, ah, Cap Scout. Uh, mm. Sure, why not? I didn't know any better. But um, I remember one of the cr- recruiters, his name was uh, Staff Sergeant Cabrera. Um, he's the one that talked me into like trying to be an 11 Bravo because he was an 11 Bravo. Um, mm. And then there was another uh, Sergeant First Class I was in there. I can't remember his name, but he th- – those. Mostly Sergeant Cabrera, he was the one that was really getting me to try to be infantry. He's like, I think you'd be a good fit for the infantry. I was like, okay. So we kind of stuck with 19 Delta for about a week before uh, my recruiter called me and be like, hey, LM Bravo's open. He's like, sign me up. 
Where's the dotted line? Sign me up right now. And, right. and that's how I chose the infantry. Nice. Well, he probably did you a solid because now you're and not I've, some, And I've just uh, stuck with it ever since. Yeah. Now you're, now you're not some overcompensating <laughs> 19 Delta calf. Plug. Uh, <laughs> schmuck. Ooh, man. Yeah, your fight <laughs> words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could be rocking your Stetson for your interview right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. that's good shit, man. So how how long were you at your unit before you started uh, hearing rumors or you and or got deployed to Panjway? Oh, my gosh. I think I think right around fresh, NTC because right? I yeah I was pretty fresh. I mean NTC was in June, so I would say so you know that's six months after basic training. You know we kind of got word of it in NTC because we kind of had an idea because I mean we were training in the desert in the mountains and we know that um, what is it third brigade third brigade needs replacement. So the next guys in line were were us. Yeah. You know so when it finally when we went to um, what is it? RIF. Uh, that's where you get your uh, multicam issue stuff. Yeah. When it when they finally gave us that, and we were like, I think we're going to Afghanistan. And <laughs> so you guys sure are all enough, I think through. about a month. No, yeah, we we're all the yeah. way through. It's, so we it was about a month later, if that. We actually got orders. We finally got our orders. It says, Hey, you're going to Afghanistan. So you know, we we refitted. We got everything. You know. Uh, put in connexes and sent off. Um, but before that, we we took a block leave in in the middle. So I think it was about August August time frame. We took two weeks off for vacation. So you know, guys get some you know R and R before we before we head out. Because after that, we spent two weeks in the field uh, out in uh, in the backwoods uh, Fort Lewis, and then a month later, we all deployed. Um, the guys deployed in October. I didn't leave, so they leave. They left late October, early November. I didn't leave until uh, November twenty six. And the only reason why I remember that is because um, I woke up that morning to go to do uh, Black Friday shopping. Uh, I woke up super early, drove down to the PX, waited in line just like everybody else, and I bought a set of um, Dre Beats prior to deployment because I left oh, that's, that that's very Gucci. night. It's pretty good yeah, for 2012. Dude. I bought, <laughs> they were like, what, $120 headphones? I got them for like, I don't know, 80 bucks or something like that. Joke's on you. You could have got them for 20 bucks at the bazaar on Kandahar. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> when I got to country, I finally learned up about the bazaar. And I was like, dude, I could have bought these for way some, cheaper. You could have got some senior beats for, uh, <laughs> yes, for 20 bucks. <laughs> What's actually funny is I actually went to the bazaar. So, because you know how they have the bazaar down at CAF? Right. Yeah, I, right. I bought some Haji copies. We all did. I, I got some Haji oh, yeah. copy movies, for oh, sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's some so, good fakes, uh, good good Chinese knockoffs floating around out there. Probably yeah. made in the same factory, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah. Who cares? Probably. Yeah. So November 26, you're still in country. Um, no, November 26 is the day I deployed. I didn't get to the day you deployed. Okay. Okay. Yep. The day I deployed. I don't think I got into a country. Let's see. So first, first leg was from Lewis Mammoth. to Alaska. We went to Anchorage, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then we made a pit stop in Uzbekistan, I believe, or was it Kyrgyz Kazakhstan? Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan yeah. something like that. One of those yeah. two. We spent two nights there. Mm -hmm, we yeah. literally just slept and went to the defect. That was it. No, Did you do the rollover actually, training and the oh yeah, that's right. Plates yeah, 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 issued. That's right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So we got plates issued and we did the rollover training. That's right. Yep, and then I went to country, and then we so spent. So your, your unit two was nights. already there for a couple of months before you showed up. Yeah, I think they've been there for almost a month pr before okay. I got there because. So the earliest guys were probably just your normal Advon folks, and then you came on with like the main body, and everybody goes. Yeah, because we chunks. it was uh, from my company. I think there was only like five or six of us that uh, flew out from our company because I was actually oh, yeah. in RD at one point. And then it's about five oh, of us because okay. it was uh, Sergeant Swan, who was my uh, squad, my old squad leader. It was uh, Gonzo, Fry, and myself were the only four guys from um, Seaco. And then there was like two other guys from um, Bico that came, went along with us from Fortnite, and we actually linked up with her units afterwards. Um. So yeah, because I mean I remember four nine getting there significantly <clears throat> earlier than one three eight did, and we were mm -hmm. quite we were quite bitter about it because <laughs> um, we were ready to go home, and we kept seeing all these new 
you know, what was interesting because you know, four nine had the the two eighty patch on their helmet, which right. uh, one two three did not have. So it was very easy to tell who the new guys were and who the new guys weren't. Yeah, and we kept seeing them all the time. It's like, where are our new guys? This is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> And you got you would have got there after Zangabad blew up. Then you weren't there when that happened. Yes, were you? actually. Yeah. So I think that explosion happened like a week or two before I got there. Mm-hmm. I believe yeah, I heard that story. Right. That's a bomber. I saw the crater and it sucked. Yes, yeah, uh, that was a huge crater. And when the guys told me that story, I was like, Oh my god! How did the rest of you guys survive? <laughs> what, what happened? Do you so know, the way what, what I did remember, you hear happened? I, the, way, the way I I remembered it was someone was pulling guard, and I think he had one of those like quick burners to make like coffee, and he mm. spilt it, and it lit up the container, something like that. <laughs> Damn, son, that's, that's what a, I remember. That's a that's bad. What I had that in an ammo container. Yeah, he had yeah. something flammable in the container because I because I, I believe it was he was pulling a night guard. A oh, night yeah. shift. That's why he had it in there. Yeah. Because I don't. I wouldn't see you trying to do that during the day. Why would you need a, a burner during the day? But apparently, it lit something. Whether it was the ammo crate or some of the flares. Oh. I think that were in that connex. Flares. Yeah. Makes it, sense. Mm, yeah. I just remember. And we so, were like, on, the we bad thing the about that. Oh, the bad thing ahead. about that was we were short on ammunition after that point, and it sucked. Because I remember, um, the way I remember it was. Our saw gunners and our 240 guys, no, our sniper guys had magazines, had nine mil mags. Our 240 gunners had one magazine and our saw gunners had nine mils with maybe one round in it. <laughs> Cause I remember well, they, theory they were lucky had to have one. nine mils at all. Cause we didn't get yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I mean, it was already bad enough that our platoon was cut down in half. Cause it mm-hmm. cause I remember our platoon, we had, one squad leader, two team leaders, and four Joes. And that was our squad. So we lost wow. half of our squad. Mm. You know, because A team was myself, Moritz, and Theory. Bravo was Chinchar and Valderrama, and that was it. We didn't have anyone else in first squad, and then Sergeant Green. So that was six dudes. Wow. That's that what we call under, undermanned and understrength. <laughs> yeah, we were definitely undermanned for sure. And then we were also short on ammunition. So, like, Theory. Yeah. Like I said, Theory was one of the saw gunners. And so was V. V. Valderrama didn't, he had his nine mil. He was issued a nine mil, but he didn't have any ammo. Yeah. Theory had a nine mil, but he had one round. And that was it. <laughs> I've never heard of machine gunners being issued nine mil. Nine That's mils. a new one to me. Yeah, well, new well we, I think they got issued nine mil because they didn't want them carrying it around the fob. It was too clunky. So they just gave them nine mils. There's no but way at, at some point That's they, they did carry... consider it. Yeah. yeah the, the infantry brain in me is just like, wait, but who has accountability for that saw? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Well, well you gotta yeah. you gotta swap off for, for Chow, obviously. So you know yeah. you'd have one guy stay in the tent and pull guard on the on their saw and then the other guy come uh, back. I think and... I, I think I'd rather hoss my saw around. I'd rather hoss the saw around. Yeah. 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 Some at some nights they did. They they just like, yeah, I'm not waiting, I'm hungry. Well just take the saw with you. It's like, okay. Yeah. You know. Yeah. This is very. I, there are only a few occasions where they just like, well, just leave the song go. Screw it. Yeah, yeah. For there sure. was always there was always at least one guy in the tent anyway. So, you know, I, I think it was okay. I think that's why they did that because someone was just always not hungry to go to Chow, or at like not the time that they wanted to go eat. So, see, I, my my conspiracy theory is still saying like, there's no way they gave you nine mils for your convenience. There was an ulterior motive somewhere. Some <laughs> officer didn't want to deal with it, and like they just sold it off as like hooking you guys up because that just makes way too much sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when did you, when did you guys uh, start stomping around in your undermanned platoon? Like, did you go out in platoon squad size elements? Like, what was your patrols? We went in, we, uh, we went in uh, platoon size elements. Yeah. Which um, but we, like I said, we only operated squad, at squad half capacity. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, but I remember the only time we ever went out deep was the patrol. Th- that was the really, really quiet patrol that we were on. That was the only time we were like maxed out. So we had our entire platoon. We had the first sergeant come out. We had company commander with his RTO. Uh, I think we had EOD that day. And we had our JTAC guys that day too. That was the only time we ever went on patrol that when we were deep, stacked. Plus, you know, a platoon of A&A, right? Ooh, that's a good one. I don't know if we had that. 
You we might have. have well, I mean, he, I think he had to. to on every patrol. Yeah, yeah I think he yeah. had to have A and A on every patrol. But yeah, I mean, but some, some, no some A and yeah, some, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. That's that's a lot of people, especially when yeah. you're walking single file at like you know three meter <laughs> intervals. Like oh it's a couple God, football dude. fields worth of people. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I remember patrols are like what. I think the average is like five hours, five or six hours of patrolling or something like that. Just, just to do a depends. loop. Yeah. I mean, it depends. I mean, I'd say we, we were lucky if it was that short. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be a good day. I'd be like, okay, we went out there, we did our job, we came back and didn't get into any firefights and yeah. no one got blown up and we didn't find an IED. Cause you find an IED that's, that's an hour, you know, yeah, for oh, yeah. EOD to exploit. But, uh, I don't know, Luke, I mean, what's, th- I'd say the shortest mission we ever did was that two and a half hour air assault and by far the longest. I mean, there were definitely some 18 hour patrols that were just 18 and 24 were pretty fairly common. Yeah. Uh, and then we got into a few like 36 hour days. Yeah. I only had one 24 hour patrol and that was probably the longest one I've ever had because we started off the morning really bad. Um, our generators went out. And you know, so waking up at two in the morning, everything is frosted over. Like our uniform is cold. My sleeping bag has a little bit of frost on top. So like when you open it, it crunches. Everything was just miserably cold. And we went out that day with like, you can have some silk on and no waffle, but you can have a ranger sleeve. I was like, dude, are you serious? And and that was that was it. That's all we had underneath. And obviously our uniform, but nothing else you can bring a poncho and will be but you won't use that until you bed down at the end of the night i mean infill and exfill gosh it was so cold it was probably below freezing uh that day i remember it was freezing because i had the little um what's that little device called where it takes the retina does the fingerprints and you got to use the little the keyboard hide. 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 yeah so i had that and I remember on my patrol, I was trying to get it started and I got to two <laughs> failures. Mm. You know, my fingers are frozen and like the, the keys are extremely small. And so I was like, dude, I can't mess this up. And my team leader, Sergeant Moritz, he's like yelling at him. He's like, wait, hurry the fuck up and get that thing started. And I was like, I'm, I'm going, Sergeant. And like, so I'm using the stylus to punch in this code one at a time very meticulously because you know that if you lock it it's locked for 24 hours and you can't yeah, get it unlocked it's down for a while yeah. yeah it's it's down for so it's down for 24 hours and you have to take it back to company command in order for them to lock it and i can't do that if i'm like 30 minutes away because we flew we flew chinooks that day and we were like miles away from you know company command and like dude if i mess up i'm screwed like <laughs> dude I'm getting yelled at I mean, on patrol. The fact that you're talking about it being cold, the fact that you're being talking about it being cold just seems weird to me. Like when you talk about being cold in Pandora, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> there were some there there were some days when I was cold. I mean, I never for, guy. I was always hot as That's because you didn't get to, you you never did that mountaintop mission that we did. We were Well, you're a pussy though when it comes to Fuck off, Curtis. <laughs> I, live, I live in Alaska. You can suck Yeah, well dick. now now, but at that time you're like, It's forty degrees outside. Where's my wolfie? Dude, no, that mountaintop was freezing. Everybody we talking, was like yeah. cuddled up under Wolfie. Fifteen hundred feet elevation gain on that. Yeah. Well, I mean it was, it so was a, yeah. Like my my time in Panjaway was December. So late November, December, January. And obviously the first week of February. So yeah, we, we were and we were never in, there then. Yeah. You were it, in the winter, winter. Dead of winter. I would dead of winter. Like all of all the patrols I went on, I got shot at one, two, three. Three times. I got shot at three times and fired my weapon once. And that was it. That's that's all I saw. Yeah. First patrol, we had some rounds fly over our head and that was it. Like shoot and scatter and that was it. Like it literally lasted three minutes like contact and well i'm like looking around i was like i don't see anything like where where's the bad guy <laughs> let me at him mm. nothing see him yeah. yep never saw that but i think you're selling yourself short a little bit because even though you were very very for a short time you didn't get to a lot of firefights mm-hmm. you, trouble found you so uh yeah kind of tell us tell us what happened to you that day so um that day we were supposed to uh recon the area called what is it the dragon spine 
Is that Zanga what it's called? Car. Yeah, the Dragon's Back. Zanga Back. Dragon's car. Back. Yep, that was it. Yeah. Um, we got reports that they were um, lobbing small arms fire and um, lobbing indirect fire into our FOB. Um, it was an elevated position, and command was like, "Nope, we're not having that." They can see right into the FOB. So, hey, you know, first platoon, your mission is to go out there, take some pictures, come back, so that we can have either the Air Force bomb the heck out of it. Oh, we can go over with the dozer. I think they ended up bombing it. Pretty sure. I'm pretty sure they ended up bombing it. And then the uh, like, dozer would have done shit to sing a bad car. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Thing's, that thing is sheer rock. Yeah, except maybe no, bulldoze yeah. a path to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I don't remember if they went back to it. I don't know. Because I like after I got blown up, I don't think they went back to that spot. I remember there were pictures of them going back, but I don't know if they did anything. Yeah. Every unit's gone there, and every unit's like, oh, we're going to do a mission. We're going to recon Zangabadgar, because it was our first mission, or not our first mission. The day of our first firefight, that was our mission. We were going to Zangabadgar to mm-hmm. recon it and take pictures and set up the feasibility of putting an OP on top of it. Yeah. Like, and then all, we never even did it, because we walked up to it, we're like, no. Like, <laughs> it's, just a, it's, it's just a spine of rock. There's nothing to build on. This is f- yeah. fucking stupid. And then, you know, we'd already been shot at, so, but yeah. It's it's a popular terrain feature to every mm-hmm. unit that's there. They think that they can use it somehow or that it's they need to construct some sort of mission around it. And honestly, all they ever really need to do is just call a Kiowa and be like, hey, bro, could you fly low and take a couple pictures? Like, yeah. there was never any need to send a patrol to Zangabadgar. And every patrol that went there ran into trouble. Yeah, obviously. So we... Uh... So you know that you know we can't take the main roads because it's it's littered with IEDs. So we stopped shy of the, you know, shy of the village, and we patrolled in on foot from the farm fields. Um, so you, you drove north out of Zangabad on yep. um, uh, Quebec. Is that right? Yep, hang a turn, hung a turn right, right on, on hyena, the, right on hyena. That's and right. Then dismounted and then dismounted off of hyena. Yeah. So there's a there's a road that I'm looking at the map now. There's a road that is just shy of the village. And I think we stopped, you know, a few hundred meters shy of it. Cause like my, I remember getting out, I can see the road coming out of the back of the striker. So we just cut across and we cut through a uh, heavy brush and everything. So we, we go over the brush and into the back of this guy's farm. And um, we, we kind of skirted up the back of the farm. And then I remember we were like three, about 300 meters or so shy of our objective. So we come up to the, uh, the T the T edge of the farm. So it's that little walkway where, you know, the farmer can go back and forth between his uh, grape rows. And I remember Moritz, he, he, he found something that day and he's just scanning and scanning back and forth. And he's like, hey, 1-1, one, one, I need you to come up here and inspect this. I think I found something. So squad leader comes up and, he, you know, Sergeant Green comes up and he's like, oh. so he waves it. So at this he he waves and he's like, I think so. And then one six comes up. Or no. One seven comes up first. He inspects it. He get you know, Mortz gives uh Sergeant Ray or Platoon Sergeant the uh mine out and he scans it and he's like, I I think you're right. And he, and one six comes up and he's like, Hey sir, I need you to come up here and check. And I'm like, Oh my god. Like, first squad, you know, you know, my team leader is up there. My squad leader is up there. The platoon sergeant is up there. And the PO is up there. It's like, dude, the entire chain of command is up there. It's like, what if you guys get blown up? What are we going to do? You know, but I'm just a Joe. I don't know any better. So I'm, I'm just pulling security. That's that's my job. And they said, hey, take a knee. I'm pulling security. I was like, okay. But, um, you know, I remember Tom Tom Stanley, our PO, he comes up. And he's like, yeah, no, let's just go around. Let's not mess with it. And he comes back and he hands, I remember him handing me a piece of deck cord that's that was probably about half an inch long. And he gave it to me. He's like, here you go and hold on to this. It was it was a piece of deck cord and it was one of, it was a sign. It's like, all right, yeah, there's probably something here. So let's back it up. So we backed up and there, more it's went up this little ledge pretty much that overlooks the farm. So he walks up there and um, I remember taking a piss before moving up. Cause I, so while they were kind of like busy checking that out, I needed to go pee. So I was like, hey, Theory, who's my saw gunner, who's a saw gunner who's, you know, 
pulling security behind me. He's like, hey, watch my back. I'm taking a piss real quick. And he's like, all right, cool. So I take a piss and, you know, Mort starts walking, my team leader, and he's like, win, hurry up. I was like, okay. So I'm like trying to button my pants up real quick. And I was like, okay, I- I'm going. So, you know, so I'm taking a piss and I'm like watching him sweep. I was like, okay, I, I need to actually also pay attention while I pee because like I can just pee and pee, just let it loose and just pay attention. I was like, okay, cool. I got it. So I follow behind him and I start marking the ground. And I just about, I crest that walkway, I remember. So I, my left foot was forward, right? I bend over, I spray the left, spray the right. I get up and I remember taking that step with my right foot and boom, the idea goes off. And I remember the first thing that I ever thought about uh, when I got blown up. My first thought that came into my mind was, holy crap, that was my right foot. How am I supposed to drive a car? You know, of all the things that I can think about, it was driving a car. Driving a car was my first thought. Not, dude, you just stepped on an IED. I think your leg might be gone. You know, of all the things that I could have thought about, it, it, yeah, it was driving a car. Well, that's something that um, we uh, we talked about in your pre-interview, you know. It's like yeah, it's, that's right. when guys get hit, they have that weird, that first line that runs through their head, like, for for us, one of our guys, actually not very far from where you got hit, our buddy Clark got hit and it messed up his left hand. It kind of messed up a mm-hmm. few of his fingers. And first thing he said was, I won't be able to, the first thing he thought he said was, I won't be able to play guitar again, you know? So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's, it's kind of crazy that, that what goes through the head, you know, in these intense yeah. moments. And did you, so, did you experience the flash of heat or did you just hear the sound? Did you black out at all? How did that kind of play out? So... After my initial thought, I remember staring out into the open field for what felt like five minutes. I felt like I was staring, you know, into the open forever. And then it all came back. So in the moment that I was kind of staring in the open, it was like the matrix. You know how, you know, when Neo does the, uh, when he leans back, it's slow motion. Everything does has like that whooshing sound, that whooshing effect. That's exactly yeah. what it felt like. And then all of a sudden, everything comes collapsing back in. I heard the right. boom of the explosion. There's ringing in my ear. And then dirt just comes flying up from the bottom of my feet, you know, into my mouth. It's, there's dirt in my mouth and my nose, oh, my yeah. eye pro, my helmet, everything. It's just dirt everywhere. And I remember, you know, the the instant pain that that soon followed. It felt like someone right. took a sledgehammer and hit the bottom of my right foot as hard as they could possibly swing it, mm-hmm. you know? And I remember, fall, you know, as I'm falling back, I remember the shock and fear in my uh, team leader's face. And like, he was just like, holy shit, you know? Cause between me and Moritz, he was maybe, seven or eight meters in front of me he won that far maybe 10 if that he i mean he was he was at a safe distance where uh the blast didn't really affect him i'm sure he uh, obviously he heard it he might have taken some a little bit of concussion to the ear but like it didn't like knock him over or anything like that i remember taking 90 percent right. of the explosion because it was just right where i was at and I remember falling back, kicking and screaming and everything and being in terrible pain. And I remember Theory, you know, yelling, new one's down, you know. And the next thing I know, I've got two guys, you know, trying to hold me down, you know. But I'm, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm in serious pain. I'm I'm scared at this point, you know. And um, the guys were holding me down because just on the backside of that little ledge that we were on, um, it, it dips, it falls down into the next uh, uh, dude's uh, dude's farm, you know. Because if I fall over, they just they just can't run and go grab me. They actually have to clear that out, and all that is thick brush. I think there was a canal back there, like a little a little canal that was back there. They just you can't just you know in Pantua, you just can't run to your buddy. You know, it, it's got to be cleared. I mean, you could take the risk, you know, but it's just like you you put yourself you know, in danger. So that's, that's why they, they jumped on me real quick to, to keep me from rolling over. Was your injury specific to just the one foot or were, yes. Did you, so it was okay. just specific to my uh, right foot. Um, so what led to my amputation was, um, so I didn't actually lose my limb. 
um, from that explosion. Uh, right. It had, so it had rained the night before. So, you know, if there was any disturbance in the dirt or anything like that, like the the Taliban was digging the night before, all of that was washed away. So all that dirt right. was packed in. So what really saved my life that day, and I've talked to other people about this, you know, if you're a believer, they say that uh, they said that God was kind of looking out for me that day. So we learned that the 15 pound HME jug was buried too deep. And I remember the crater, it was th- about three ish, maybe four feet and about no three to four feet wide and about the same distance deep. It was buried pretty deep. So what ended up leading to my amputation was the kinetic energy from the explosion shot up through my foot. So if you imagine your right foot, right? I lost three of my toes. So the index toe, I can kind of move. And my large toe, the big, big toe was kind of stuck in the up flex position. And that's what it felt like. I can wiggle it up and down, but it felt like it was stuck in the up flex position. Uh, My foot swelled to twice the size and I had major blistering on the top of my foot and at the bottom of my foot. And I broke my heel in three places. Uh, the I remember the the doctors at um, Calf Hospital said that hey you've got you know X amount of broken toes and you've got a calcaneus fracture man your your heel bone is shattered in three places. But and none I, of your like nothing uh, above the heel was broken. None, no, nope. no other. I had wow. So I so I remember during rehab I had full full flex and full rotation. I could do mm. a full a right three sixty rotation and full left three sixty rotation. Wow, uh, with my ankle. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, yeah. really, man. And I mean, like you, you got. To, I mean, I won't say you got lucky, but like if if you're going to step on an IED, you know, like you, you're fortunate because a 15 pound IED without having that rain the night before, yeah, could have could have either been a double amp or could have taken your life. So yeah, you know. so I remember the uh, EODs. Uh, so the EODs told the guys, and the guys told me. They said that hey, you're really to walk lucky to walk away alive because that they said that that yeah. ID was angled, and they said that it would have cut me in half if it had not rained the night before and if it wasn't buried too deep. They said that that yeah, ID yeah. probably would have killed you because of the way it was angled. Mm-hmm. I was like, holy fuck, you know? <laughs> yeah, the, the depth is definitely it. a big thing. I mean, that's something we saw a few times was where if they buried it too deep, it just, it was just a concussive effect. Yeah. You know, we, the, I think Wallach's was buried pretty deep. And I think, um, I know Anderson's was buried really deep mm-hmm. and those guys, they just got pushed around and they, you know, in both cases, actually, they, they both had selective amputations as a result as well. So it's pretty common, uh, or not common, but, um, there's, there's definitely a string between those in terms of when they're buried so deep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I so what really led to my selective amputation was um, there was just a bunch of dead skin that uh, just got worse from from the time I left country to the time I got home. So if you imagine your foot, right, the arch of your foot, I had a about a baseball size black spot underneath the arch of my foot. It wasn't directly underneath; it kind of rolled over up the side a little bit, but. It's about, it was about the size of a uh, baseball. I mean, all that entire thing was just completely black. It was, it was just dead skin, dead tissue, dead muscles, dead nerves, all of it. So um, when I got home to uh, San Diego, which is where I did my hospitalization, uh, Balboa Naval Medical Center, the doctor's like, hey, you know, we can see the dead skin that's underneath your uh, foot and we need to do surgery on it right away. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut away all that black dead skin and we're going to cut away until we start seeing uh red tissue so so the healthy stuff so we don't know how far this has gone so we're we're going to operate on it so they ended up going almost all the way down to the bone in some parts Uh, so it it was pretty much like a crater It, it the outside wasn't so bad but as you got closer and closer to the middle it it got deeper and deeper to the point where like i remember at one point because i was curious because I'm wearing like that. I if you I can put two fingers in and if you just pull the the muscle away, you can see the white bone of my foot at the very bottom. And that's how far they had to cut down. Mm. Um it was it was pretty it was pretty gnarly. Pretty gnarly. Yeah. I think I, I think I, yeah, I think I'm with you. I'd rather have I'd rather have tink tink legs than uh <laughs> a, a, a yeah. busted foot. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
so talk us through that decision because I know you you mentioned in the pre interview about that that hard decision to make to like cut, you know cut the leg and do to choose to to lose your leg versus having it taken from you like talk us through that process and what that was like. So for you. they gave me so the surgeons gave me the brief. I would say about April May time frame and be like, hey, look, you know, these are your two options. Um, number one, we could skin graft your foot and fuse your your heel bone. But you wouldn't be able to walk on it. You wouldn't be able to run, jump, or put any pressure on it. You'd be tied to a wheelchair and on crutches and on pain medications for the rest of your life at the age of 20. Or you mm. could have, you can opt for a selective amputation and, you know, be back on your feet, you know, in three to six months and doing everything and anything you want as a young, healthy 20 year old. So I was like, for the first few, weeks i i had i had no idea what i I didn't know what to say i didn't know what to think because i i remember it was the hardest decision i've ever had to make because i i remember sitting in my my barracks room pretty much it was practically a hotel room uh it's like a hotel room or no i'm sorry it's a hospital bed on steroids uh because mm-hmm. it was na- it was a naval barracks it almost looked like a hospital room but mm-hmm. i remember i spent weeks in bed just like contemplating on like, what am I gonna do with my life? You know, where do I go? What do I do? Like, wh- how is my how, how how do I live my life with this decision? You know, and I thought about both. What would my life be like if I was stuck, to, you know, tied to a wheelchair and crutches at 20 years old? Or just, you know, just the thought of having to amputate my leg. You know, it took me several weeks to just, you know, decide what I wanted to do. You know, I, I hardly slept. I hardly ate. And, you know, because I, at the same time, I remember I was super depressed just because like, I don't know what to do at this point. I don't know what to do with my life, you know, and I lost a lot of weight. Um, just to kind of give you guys a reference, I was 135 pounds in country by, uh, so February 2nd, I was 135 pounds. After two weeks in the hospital, I was down to 119. And that's just coming home, you know, that's actually finally getting yeah. stabilized at Balboa. And by the time I got to my surgery, I was about, I was at 109 pounds. So from February to June ish, you know, I was at 109 pounds for someone who's five foot six. I was extremely Dang, so. skinny because I remember really my nurse kids manager. She's like, "Are you doing all right?" And I was like, "I guess." And she's like, "Kevin, why don't you come stand on the scale for me?" You know. And she was like, "You know." She gave me that look. It's like, Kevin, you're at 109 pounds. And I was like, "Uh, okay. What do I need to be? You need to be at like 125. You know, <laughs> right. like right. somewhere around the 120 area." And I was like. Oh, okay. So she immediately put me on um, Ensure diet. Like you need to be drinking this like two or three times a day, like after every mm-hmm. meal, to yeah. to get a little bit of protein in me to to get that weight on. Um, you know, like I didn't, I I don't remember the last time. I think the last time I was one hundred nine was probably basic training, but I was five foot one. Going into basic training, I was it super was, tiny. I was, I was this so little, tiny little guy in basic training because I remember, <laughs> like the rucksack was like touching my butt. Yeah, in oh, basic man. training because wow. that thing was so huge. You grew after you joined the military. You grew yes. more. Yes, that's I great. Did. I grew. That's a, that's a first. I've never heard. That. I've never heard that. Yeah, yeah dude, I was before, only like yeah. five foot one. Yeah, that's like I didn't. Funny. So like when I graduated high school, I was like four eleven, coming out of high school. <laughs> you know, I kind of, I was, I kind of grew a little bit after, uh, you know, during college, but I, I didn't hit five yeah. foot six until I was in the army. You know, so that's wild. So yeah, you grew, so you grew I, five inches in your first year in the army. <laughs> yeah, right. Some say it's like, dude, the army turned you into a man. You know, it's sprouted. <laughs> well, they, the army gave you five inches, and then they took five inches off your foot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I still retain my height. I'm still five foot six. You know, maybe almost five foot seven if I'm in boots. But hey, there you go. But yeah, so you know, I, I finally, I, I just, 
I just had an epiphany, I guess. I just I just remember telling myself one day, it was like, all right, dude, you need to stop being a little bitch and get back on your feet and get back into the fight. So I was like, okay, doing it. I rolled over. It was like 6 p.m. I was like, tomorrow morning. I'll start tomorrow morning. Because <laughs> it was late at night. I couldn't do anything. So that very next day, I hit the gym. Straight up, I, I hit the gym. I started working out. And um, I told the doctors, like, all right, let's do the selective amputation. Um, but I didn't go through it the first time because I was scared. I remember calling my surgeon, my Navy, the Naval surgeon the day before because I was just terrified. It's like, I, I wanted to do it, but I just I just didn't have the, the courage to actually go through with the operation. Right. So obviously the Navy surgeon was a little mad because, you know, um, when they – when they schedule a surgery, that's yeah. they put money into that, and that's already money that's put away. And then when you cancel, they lose that, whether they perform the surgery or not. It, if oh, they perform the surgery, okay. great. If not, they are still losing that money either way. My Navy surgeon, she was not very happy with me that day. <laughs> you know, so she sat me down a week or two later, and she gave me a packet of other cases of people who are like me, but you know didn't obviously didn't receive the same injuries I did, but they have the same thing, you know, um, mm -hmm. a fused ankle, skin graft on the foot, and the, she, it was just page after page of what people's foot looked like and the quality of life that they had. And it's like, this is the quality of life that you're going to have if you decide to keep it. And this, and then she showed me another pack. I was like, this is the quality of life that you could have, you know, with an amputation and just, just showed amputees just doing amazing things in their life. You know, so I I sat at that table for almost 45 minutes, turning pages and just thinking about it. And I was like, okay. You know, I was like, I, I'm sorry I didn't go through it. I, I was just scared, you know. It, it's a big decision. She's like, I, I know yeah, it's a big say decision, it's but like we're here for you. <laughs> we're here to support you in everything that you want to do. And we're here for you. That, that's what we're here for. We're here to support you. So, you know, two weeks later, you know, finally went through the, with the surgery um, so the surgery was a two-part surgery. It was very complex. Uh, number one was, uh, so they cut the an they cut the foot at the ankle. And the reason why they did that was because, because I had that open wound at the bottom, they wanted to check for bone marrow infection. So what she did was she cut my leg, she cut the foot off at the ankle and injected some radiation onto the, onto the foot and let it sit overnight to radiate, to check to see if there was any bone marrow infection. Because if it was, then she's going to have to cut higher than what she intended. So I remember having this big old cast from my ankle all the way up to uh, my hip. It's just this big, giant, heavy cast. So let it sit overnight, you know, and then she took me into the operating room the very next day and, and did an MRI, did the scan and said, okay, um, so there's no radiation there's no bone marrow infection so we're going to cut it right here you know where you kind of want it i tried to keep it as much you know as much as possible but she's like look i know you want to keep as much as possible but the longer the limb you have you're going to be limited to uh the different types of uh prosthetics that you can use so the thing about prosthetics is you have to have a certain cut length um if you have it too long you're only limited to like a few but if you cut it a little higher, you know, you have a much wider range of foot to, uh, feet to select and to use. So she cut it, you know, a little higher than what I wanted. But I mean, I can, I have the foot that I want. It's called the tactical. It has great rebound. Um, it is extremely light. I use it every day. You know, I've been using it since 2013. So I, I you know, going on, uh, it's eight years now. And it's great, you know. I've I've done a lot of things with that foot, and uh, overall, you know, the surgery and operation went great. And how long before you were? I was about to say, how long before you kind of up on your feet? So the ground? operation was like June. I was I was actually up on my feet a lot quicker than I was supposed to because the guys came back in like s late August, early September. So so July, August maybe september so i think i was up on my feet in like two months not even three i was pushing it for sure i was really i would say i was naive at that time i want to say and and yeah i was naive because um 
I didn't learn later on that, you know, being an amputee with the recovery and the changing of the limb size, that is something that you cannot, um, you cannot get ahead of yourself. You actually have to let it heal and adapt and change. Right. You have to get, you have to adapt to the limb as it goes. You can't rush that. And I paid the price for it early on. It was a lot of pain and a lot of nerve damage. Not well. I mean, so like it, it out. Not like nerve damage where you can't use it. It was getting used to, you know, just the amount of force and impact because you know you're. Your shin, the shin bone was not built and designed to take pain like that. And especially, you know, the way that they, they cut the limb and they peeled the skin over, you know, you know, the bottom of my foot, that's all dead nerves. I mean, I can feel it because I know that I'm poking myself. You know, if I take like yeah. a pen or like a toothpick and poke at it, I can feel it. There's certain spots, obviously, I can't feel. But like if I close my eyes and someone else does it, I actually don't feel that bottom of that part. But like... Do you, you know, remember I, the moment where you, you stood up for the first time on a on a prosthetic? Yes, I do. I remember um, taking my first step. It was pretty painful just because I, I wasn't used to it. But um, I kind of like twisted my, uh, my physical therapist's arm. So like the only way to walk home with your prosthetic that day was to walk one loop around um, – the physical therapy area, it was probably a good 200 yard walk for sure. You have to walk that entire uh, corridor unassisted, one entire loop and you cannot fall. That was the stipulation. If you can go all the way around, you can keep it. I walked all the way around. I, I almost fell and I was in a lot of pain, but I like bit my mouth. I bit my tongue on that one. It's like, if I'm going to meet the guys, I wanted to be on my feet when I met them. Cause when they last saw me, I was on the ground. So I, it meant more, I think it, it meant more to me in the platoon if they saw me back on my feet. I had I mean, a cane a, with me. That'd mean a lot to your guys too, man. Cause for us, like coming, coming home and getting off the plane and seeing our buddies who had gotten yep. blown up or whatever, like seeing them, you know, there present was yeah. a huge, a huge, burden kind of off the shoulders of the guys coming yeah. back. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I like I kept in touch with the guys. They knew that I was okay, but they were just Yeah. you know, it's another thing to know it. It's another thing to it. know it and to see it. Yeah. Like you can yeah. you can get Facebook messages all day long, but yeah. to see your buddy in fleshed and see him standing on his own two feet or you know, yeah. in his wheelchair or whatever, like just seeing him there cuz last time you see him he's all fucked up and you put him on a helicopter. Yeah. It does a lot that's right. for for the guys, so you know that's good. Yeah, thinking the, I behalf. remember the guys' face. I, they they were extremely, you know, overjoyed to to see me on my feet again. And, and they knew that I was an amputee at that point, but they at the same time they were all overwhelmed to see me back on my feet again. So it, it was really good. I definitely enjoyed them. You know, I enjoyed and remember that experience very well. Yeah. Now. I mean, you eventually you kind of had to make a decision, though. I mean, it kind of every every amputee or severely wounded soldier does. Mm -hmm. Am I going to remain in the army, you know, and or am I going to get out? And you know, and obviously, most people do get out, and there's nothing wrong mm -hmm. with that. I mean, yep. you have done you have done your time. You have given you know a limb, or you've given your your health to the military. It's fair to leave, uh, yeah. but you, uh, but and a minority stay in. Uh, but obviously, there's some limitations. So. What kind of went through that decision process for you about whether you wanted to stay in or wanted to get out? So when I made the decision to get back up on my feet, my goal was to, you know, get back into the army and get back to a line unit. That was my intention. Um, so at the hospital, we had this thing called a scrimmage. It was you, your squad leader, your um, platoon sergeant, and your company commander, the first sergeant, and all the civilians that you work with. You know, the scrimmages were designed to kind of keep track of the soldiers individually so that everyone's on the same page, everyone knows what you're doing. Um, that specific day, um, Major General uh, Martin, he was Theodore Martin. He was the CG of Fort Irwin. Um, General Martin was, you know, I, I owe a lot of my uh, career to that, that man because he was, he, definitely took a lot of time and effort. And I'd, I'd, I'd never seen this before. 
but once a month, General Martin would fly down to Balboa Naval Medical Center and he would come down and see all of his wounded soldiers, all the guys who came back from Afghanistan because they were under his, you know, under his care. So he came in and we'd always meet up, you know, downstairs in the theater where the rec center was and he would come in and he would just, you know, do a little meet and greet. He would kind of chit chat with all the, all of his soldiers who were wounded you know, and he would just, you know, chit chat with them. He would just shoot the shit with all the guys and gals that were there. And, you know, he really did care for all of his soldiers. Like he took the time out of his schedule, his busy schedule as a CG to come down and see the troops. Um, but I, but that day he sat in on some of the scrimmage because he wanted to know, you know, uh, what his soldiers were doing, what their plan was and how he could help them, which, you know, I told him that day, he's like, hey, you know, I told my company commander that day, he's like, hey, sir, I want to stay in and I would do whatever it takes to stay in whatever the army asks of me, I will do it. And General Martin that day, he said he was so pumped up and motivated. And he's like, I'll tell you what, you come down to the next rotation and I will put you through all the tests. I'll get you in touch with one of the companies down there. It was 11th ACR. And, you know, we'll put you through the ringer. We'll do everything you need to get back into the fight. And if you pass all the tests, I will personally write you a letter of recommendation to get back into the army. And so that's what we did. Um, you know, me and my uh, platoon sergeant, uh, Sergeant First Class Robert Pareto, who's a good friend of mine, uh, you know, he was my platoon sergeant at the time. And he's kind of taken me in, you know, under his wing and, and you know, part of his family now. Uh, we spent holidays together, but when we were at the hospital, you know, he was my guy that I leaned on a lot. You know, he was the one that helped me push through, you know, getting better, getting fit, you know, running, working out, rocking, all that stuff, you know, two times a day. We were working out two times a day in the morning and the afternoon. And I, you know, just started eating and started working out. I mean, it was a long road to recovery. I mean, I spent a year and nine months in recovery and just pushing my body and obviously learning to be an amputee at the same time. But we worked hard to get through all the tests. So when we finally went down to Fort Irwin, so I had to do a PT test, a weapons qual, and a six mile ruck march. Um, we were supposed to do an obstacle course as well, but we never got to that. But I did spend two days in the field uh, as an op four, um, and, and just you know working with op four, uh, working with eleventh ACR as an op four, and you know doing patrols with them, you know because they wanted to see how how I was as a soldier and being actually in the field because that was the biggest part, you know. But I passed the PT test, um, but I didn't do the run. Um, I hadn't, tra I wasn't training a whole lot for the run, but I did pass the walk though, for sure. Um, I didn't start doing my runs until um, I got to the Army Marksmanship Unit. So from when I got to the Army Marksmanship Unit into 2015, every single PT test, including the ACFT, all the diagnostic ones that we've taken, I have done the run on every single one. I did not walk because I didn't want to feel like I was a special case and, and, and I didn't want to put myself in that position because if I fought to stay in the army, then I need to keep myself accountable to everyone else. So I, I hate running just like anyone else in the army. I, I absolutely <laughs> hate running, but like, I know that if I slack on my running, you know, it's going to cost me my career because, you know, I chose to run. And so I have to keep myself accountable and run. So I run twice a week now. I don't like it, so, but I run. Yeah. So back to the the trials kind of mm -hmm. at Irwin. Um, you know, obviously you passed. Yep. Um, so how, how did that end up in result in you going to the marksmanship unit? So after I passed everything, I got my letter of recommendation, you know, um, everything got pushed through. I got co-ed, which is continue on active duty. Um, mm -hmm. just like anyone else who is PCS, PCSing, you know, you got to call HRC and find a, a duty assignment. So, you know, HRC called me, the branch, the branch guy called me and it's like, Hey, where do you want to go? Uh, so I put in for Carson Campbell and Riley. 
Carson and Campbell because those were where some of the guys, some of uh, the guys from the platoon were going. If I was to go somewhere, I would at least go where you know I had friends that I can at least keep in touch with. I wasn't by myself, and I chose Riley for the history because you know obviously playing Call of Duty, Big Red One, it, you know it, I wanted to be there for the history, but. <laughs> Kind of glad mm. I didn't actually go to Riley. Yeah, that you was, didn't. That yeah. yeah, you dodged a bullet there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. But um, so we kind of called back and forth, and uh, the HRC guy was like, hey, man, do you like to shoot? I was like, yeah, I, I do. I don't mind. So he's like, hey, you ever heard of the Army Marksmanship Unit? I was like, no. What is that? So I was like, all right. So I got a guy. Um, his name is Sergeant First Class Armando Ayala. He is the coach down there, and he's looking for guys just like you, you know, wounded guys coming out of uh, Afghanistan, and they have what's called a Paralympic shooting team. So here's his number. Why don't you get in contact with him and see if that's something you want to do. If not, then, you know, give me a call back, and we'll find you an assignment somewhere. I was like, okay. So I called uh, Armando, and, you know, he he's like, hey, man, what's going on? I was like, hey, I'm Sergeant Wynn. Uh, I'm down here at uh, Balboa Naval Medical Center and I'm looking for a duty assignment. And the guy from HRC said that, you know, you have openings on the Paralympic shooting team. And I'm just kind of call you just to kind of see wh- what it is. He's like, yeah, man, I got you. So it gives me a brief rundown of the history on, on what they do and what the team does. So he pretty much gave me a quick spiel because it was like a yeah. 10 minute conversation. It's like, hey, um, you know, we're the United States Army Martian Ship Unit, you know, we compete in national and international competitions, and our main goal is to make the Olympic team. But we shoot guns every day. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And he's like, is that something you want to do? He's like, yeah. So he kind of kind of asked me a little bit, a couple questions, you know, asked me where I was from, uh, what unit I served, where I came from uh, in Afghanistan. And he kind of asked me, like, what my personality was. So the biggest thing that they were looking for is, like, they were looking for people who have discipline, who um, have an open mind. Uh, being Having an open mind is, is one of the bigger things because uh, it's easier to mold teach. and teach. That's right. So okay. he's like, okay, you sound like a good fit. So here's what we're going to do. You know, we're going to uh, fly you out. You know, we'll get in touch with your unit and we'll coordinate everything. So uh, was it maybe like a week or two later? <laughs> They flew me out. So I went on TDY down to Fort Benning. I spent a week out there uh, meeting the team. So I met the coach, which was Armando at the time, and I met the team. So they kind of put me through the ringers a little bit. You know, I did PT with the guys. Um, I kind of sat through a couple interviews. I just kind of wanted to see how I was as a person. Uh, You know, kind of like how I mentioned earlier in our pre-interview, it's like, you know, they want to vet the newcomer, um, the biggest thing, obviously, I said was, you know, having the discipline, dedication, being open-minded. And for the para guys, the biggest thing for them was making sure that I was not on any medications because um, one of their last recruits was on medication. And that really affected that person as not only as an athlete, but as a soldier as well. So not being on any medication was a big one for them. So I was like, okay, you're a good fit for the team. You look, you sound like a good fit for the team. So they they showed me around. They let me shoot the gun for a little bit. And it's like, what do you think? It's like, this is actually kind of fun. I actually like it. So I was like, all right. So here, check it out. Um, we're actually going to the Olympic Training Center here in a couple of weeks. Why don't you come on out? We'll bring some extra gear for you. And then, you know, spend a week with us, train with us, you know. And if you still like it, you know, we'll bring you on to the team. So I flew home from Fort Benning. And then I flew out to Colorado Springs about two weeks later or a month later, I forget. And, you know, I actually got to use the equipment. I got to shoot the air rifle and I shot for a week and it was, it was pretty good. You know, they ran me through a couple of drills and they really tested me as, as an athlete. It's like, you take directions very well. You're not stubborn, you know, you try things, you listen to us. So you're going to be a good fit. So do you still want to come onto the team? It's like, absolutely. So uh, I PCS'd from Balboa in October, like late October, I believe. And I finally arrived at the unit just before Thanksgiving. And this was 2015, uh, right? 2014. 2014, okay. Yeah, so I pcs to from San Diego to Fort Benning in October, November of 2014. 
Nice. And then I actually didn't start actually training until 2015. I think the the big thing for me about that story is like the HRC dude hooked you up, man. Yeah, he really did. That is such an exceptional thing for somebody in that job to do for someone. Well, I I think he kind I I think he knew what I was. He knew I was an amputee, and I feel like this guy kind of did it before. I feel like he he, you know, all the guys are um that were currently on the para team at the time i'm pretty sure he kind of knew at one point I had that like th- this was just like right. a little like it had a little sticky note like you're not going to use this but it's it's on his computer just in case he he, he needed to yeah. so right so he That's definitely hooked shit. it up for sure well yeah. there's probably not a whole lot of you know amputees that have a coad the continuation mm-hmm. on active duty um that would meet the criteria you know, so like it's you know it's a very small pool, it's a very specific need, and you know it's awesome that he was looking out for that, and then he was actively pursuing that. I mean, you're probably doing probably the only non uh, non soft unit in the army that shoots every single day. Yeah. So it's what 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 a perfect uh, what a perfect Good mix. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It it's so since I've gotten there, it is it's tough for sure. The the training that you have to put into it is a whole nother level. I mean, cause like these athletes that you're talking about, they are Olympic athletes. Right. You know, when I got to the team, you know, um, one of the guys on the team, you know, Michael McPhail, he's a two time Olympian. The coach for the international rifle, he was a four time Olympian. Um, That's wild. The up to graphs between the both of them currently between uh, Mr. Optograft and Sergeant First Class Optograft, so Mrs. Optograft, between the both of them, they have four Olympic Games between the both of them. It's ridiculous. Wow. And you and you were saying like when we started the interview mm-hmm. that they pull a lot of these these shooters from the NCAA. So Correct. obviously, you know, your Paralympic team, I would suspect, is mostly combat veterans, but then you have yes. the, ma- the, other, the majority of the team really are essentially civilians. Yes, how how does are. that dynamic work? Uh, so so like the only thing I can think of that's comparable is like when you have like direct admit like nurses and doctors and stuff, which is a big like they do that. They bring in mm-hmm. you know lawyers and doctors from that are basically civilians. They do like almost no basic training, and then they right they're in the so army, but they're the really only not. Difference on that is that um, is the training basis. So they already have training with a team. They know how to. They already know how to train. They already know how to shoot. They know how to work with team. The only difference is now they're doing it through the army. Right. Um, so just like anyone we anyone who joins the army, obviously, they, you know, you have to go through maps. You have to uh, go through basic training in AIT. Um, they pick the MOS that they want. Um, for the guys, we we just recommend them um, infantry. For the simple fact that it's on Sand Hill, it's at Fort Benning. So and and in, at the time. You know, when it was still 14 weeks versus, uh, what is it, 22 like, or 29? Yeah, it's a lot Something like now. that. Yeah. Um, it was it's the just fastest easier way to get for, through. Yeah, yeah, it's just faster. It's just less time that they have to spend off the gun um, so that we can just bring them back and then they can just roll right into training. Uh, so they don't so lose that's wild. They lot. join the Army knowing they're going to the marksmanship. Yeah, unit. so when they like join. Like it's guaranteed when they sign up. So when they join, we send them what's called a LOA, a letter of acceptance. It is a it is a memo from the from our commander who's a lieutenant colonel signed by him saying hey so and so is joining the army and when they are done with basic and tra- basic training in AIT which are whatever the MOS that they choose they have orders going straight to the army marksmanship unit you just hand that to the recruiter and the recruiter just processes them like any other recruit but they add the LOA into the uh, system. Most recruiters. So, I mean, so these will guys are not all directly that. recruited. Yes. These guys are recruited by the Army Marksmanship Unit. So yes. it's kind of backwards from the way you join the Army, where mm-hmm. like, you're, hey, I want to join the Army. Now I'm going to pick a job and I'm going to mm-hmm. get what I want. But this is like, hey, we want you in this unit and we want you to join the Army to be in this unit and we're yes. going to bring you tracked here. Yes. Um, and all of that is wild. tracked through the S1. S1 tracks everything. So from, or no, the S1, your team that you join and the commander tracks all of it so you know every every any issue you have at meps we try to work through it basic training we know when you ship off to basic training we know when you graduate basic training 
and then we know when you get to AIT, and then we know when you graduate AIT, and we know when to pick you up as well. So all of that is tracked for sure. So they have to choose an MOS like that's not. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yes, for so you the, could be like, a like ninety-two said, foxtrot and then go join the. Yeah. So like Brandon, Brandon Muskie, he is. Um, Oh gosh, I don't remember the MOS, but he he work, he's in transportation. He does all the logistics. So when the transportation guys are, you know, going back and forth with their stuff, he manages all the logistics of it on a computer. Gotcha. Uh, one of my soldiers, Sajin, who is actually a 2020 Olympian, um, she is a uh, 13 Bravo field artillery. And then um, Allie, Allie Wise, who is also a 2020 Olympian, she is um, human resources, I believe. I thought she was a nutritionist because she has a, a bachelor's degree in nutrition. I thought she would have chosen that one, but I think she went with HRC. Not too sure about that one. So, so is it possible? Same question here. <laughs> yeah is is it is it possible for anybody to get into that? Let's say you're let's say you're an eleven Bravo. Mm -hmm. You know you're you're bored because no one's deploying anymore. Is it possible to get into that unit without being recruited into it from outside the army? Yes. Or is it, so okay. the um, so there are four other f four other teams that you can possibly join: the service rifle, service pistol, um, the instructor training group, and the action shooting team. Um, so your service pistol and service rifle guys, we they generally pull from either uh, the Camp Perry matches or I don't know if you guys have heard of this competition, but All Army. You guys heard of that? Mm -hmm. So All Army is a match that the Ar Army Marshalship Unit hosts once a year. It is the Small Arms uh, Championship. And guys, guys and gals from all over the Army sign up for this competition they shoot, you know, the classic M4 out of distance on on a KD range. They shoot, you know, the M17, you know, kind of like uh, an action style. So they'll shoot at silhouettes. You know, they'll shoot in the kneeling position. Right. They'll shoot in the standing position, the prone position. They'll do mag changes and everything. And then they go and shoot bullseye with their pistol. And then there's like a three-gun event as well. And all they use is... Your standard M4 with either an ACOG or a red dot and your M17, and that's it. You know, but it's a huge match to just kind of showcase what our soldiers are capable of. And that is a portion of our recruiting pool. You know, of guys who can shoot pistol or rifle very well, the service rifle and service pistol will recruit from that as well. Mm. Um our instructor training group, those guys who come to the unit, those guys come from all walks of life. Um, I would say majority of those guys down there come from obviously the big army, but a good portion of them come from Ranger Regiment because of 375. Because 375 is just literally down the street. Because right, there's that like, makes sense. let's see, there's there's Chris, there's both Chris's, Mike, and there's a bunch of other guys that are from IT that. I've gone to ITG and they are all from Ranger Regiment. I mean, you know, these guys are extremely knowledgeable when it comes to shooting. Um, but I mean, it, it, it's a mixture. It's a hodgepodge. But those guys have a very, very strict um, recruiting process. I actually got to sit in one of them one day and they were actually testing this new recruit using the personality test. <laughs> Yeah, so the, it, so it's <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> yeah, so it, it was very extensive. But I mean, so the instructor training group, they have a very big responsibility. So when these guys are teaching marksmanships, they're not only just teaching the guys, but they're also trying to you know, talk to, you know, battalion sergeant majors, battalion commanders, you know, division commanders, you know. They're they're talking to, you know, upper echelons to try to recommend you know, how they can better their marksmanship and how they can better their training. You know, you really want to have the right guy talking to mm -hmm. to the these leadership. You just don't want to have a guy who is who has a big ego talking to these battalion, you know, sergeant managers and commanders. You know, it, it, it makes a bad it makes us look bad because the you know, you want to have the right person talking to the right people. And you also want to have the right person teaching as well. So I just got caught a small bit of it. They said that there's nothing wrong with the way that you teach. It is your attitude is what we have concerns about. So here's 
here's your test. So you teach us how to reload with and without retention for a rifle and pistol. And I, I walked out after that. I don't know what uh, transcribed uh, in that interview, but just sitting in uh, in that team room with those guys and just realizing like, you know, the recruiting process for this is very, very strict because we, they, they've had a lot of guys come in and it's just like, they're great teachers, but like, you know, they're, they're either lacking or they have too much of one thing. You kind of want to have a good balance of it, you know? So it, it, it's, it's important. You know, the, the, that team has worked very hard to rebuild from where they came from and then to rebuild the marksmanship program for the army as a whole they man those guys have done something that that is you know it's amazing what they have done and i think in my personal opinion they have taken the marksmanship training program what the army used to have and then what they teach now is is amazing they 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 debunked a lot of old myths and now they have a standard and a language that no matter where you go, everyone should be speaking the same language. So that, that way, you know, you don't show up to a platoon and you have, you know, six guys trying to teach the same concept. No, trying to teach one idea, but there's six, six different concepts because obviously everyone learns differently. And everyone sees it differently. You know, they've, they've gone through a lot of effort to try, to try and just make a baseline of speaking the same language, teaching the same knowledge. So th there's a baseline that everyone knows. It's like, okay, if you've been to this course or, you know, if you've been taught by the AMU, you have this baseline of teaching. So that when you come back to us and, and you wanna learn, you know, obviously base, basic, moderate and advanced, you know, teaching skills, you know, you still have that same basic knowledge and then we can teach you, you know, we can get you to the next level which is great. And, and then you don't have, you know, NCOs button heads with each other. <laughs> so we've, uh, we've kind of come full circle from the very beginning. We began with the army of marksmanship and then we've ended on Mar army of marksmanship. But, uh, so I think, you know, we're kind of closing in on the end here, Kevin, but normally the way we, we end these things out is we give folks a chance to just, you know, we give them the platform to talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about. If there's something we didn't cover or something that you really want to give a shout out to or whatever, you know, the floor is yours and, and drive it home for us, man. Uh, you know, I, I really don't have much to say besides the fact that, you know, I, I think my career has, has gone somewhere that I never thought that, you know, I, I would have taken. Cause I, you know, as a Joe, I always thought that, you know, it, I was going to be, when I was a Joe, I thought I was going to be a drill instructor by like mid career. I'd be a drill somewhere and then I'd be a platoon sergeant somewhere. I never thought that I would have lost my limb and then I would have ended up at the Army Marksmanship Unit and be a 2020 Paralympian. If you'd told me that as a Joe, you know, if you told, you know, Private Wynn in 2012 that, you know, he's going to lose his leg, but he was going to go to the Paralympic Games in 2020. I think I would have laughed in your face for sure. But <laughs> I mean, you know, just being at the Army Marksmanship Unit, the things that I've learned, the people that I've come across, you know, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. Honestly, just just looking back, you know, who I am today and then who I was a few years ago, you know, it's I'm just a completely different person. And I, I've definitely learned a lot about the Army. I've learned a lot about this unit. I've learned a lot about re resiliency. I've learned a lot about discipline. You know, I've learned a lot about hard work and I've learned a lot about myself and what I'm actually capable of, you know, because I've I put myself through the ringer. I put myself through pain, you know, just just for some of the things that I want to do in my career later on. You know, I, I've learned that's like I can I can do whatever I want if I put my mind to it, you know, especially my career, you know, after this next uh, Paralympic Games, you know, it's going to require twice as much effort and twice as much work if I want to be successful. So I'd say that's a, a pretty good sentiment to, to end on right there. I mean, 
you know, one thing that we really appreciate about this interview was the the positive, kind of the positive message that it sends. I mean, you you went to war, you had this traumatic wound, and then you ended up in this really unique, very special, once in a lifetime kind of you know unit in position. And it's you know a lot of guys get very frustrated and they get very hard on themselves, but you know stories like yours are kind of proof that hey man, like you, like you said, put in the work, put in the effort, don't give up, have a goal, and you can get there. And we we really appreciate that about your story. So. Kevin, thank you so much for for coming on, for joining us on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. It was a blast. I enjoyed it. And, and, you know, I I share my story all the time. So, you know, if, you know, my story resonates with you guys and you guys take something away and, you know, I'm I'm all for it. I'm super glad that you guys can because I know that there are buddies of mine who always look back, you know, if they're having a bad day, they'll, you know, they kind of just think about me and there's like, you know, Wynn's doing a lot right now. And, you know, if he can do it, so can I. And, you know, all my buddies, you know, I, they they do a lot of amazing things. And, you know, if, if I can do it, I know they can. And they are, you know, they're super successful. You know, a lot, they're not, a, not a whole lot of guys left from my platoon, but those that are, are still in, you know, they have really great careers and they're just crushing it right now. Nice, awesome. man. Awesome. Well, Kevin, we, we appreciate it, man. And uh, thanks for coming on and talking. Yeah, talking thanks for having us. me, guys. Thank you for listening to another episode of Season 3 of the Panjway Podcast. We appreciate you sticking with us all the way to the end of the episode. But just one more thing before you go, please hit the like and subscribe button and make sure that you are following us on our social media.